Thank you, Senator Cantwell, for welcoming, welcoming all of us to Washington. We are all thrilled to be here. We are so excited at DARPA to have a fully in-person summit following a year hiatus and a couple of years of all virtual events. So I'm sure you're excited too. Thank you for taking the time to come and join us to talk about microelectronics and microsystems. So uh, my job is threefold here. One, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about DARPA. So let me start just with a quick show of hands. How many of you have never worked with DARPA before? Okay, that's actually a respectable number, but, uh, and most of what I'm gonna say is for you. So for all of you that got, all of you that know DARPA really well, I won't be offended if you decide it's a good chance to check your email. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about DARPA, why DARPA, how we work. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about DARPA's role in the microelectronics ecosystem. And then I might put in a couple of shameless plugs at the end to um, help you figure out, especially if you're new, um, how you might be able to connect with us, with us a little bit more easily. So first of all, um, DARPA's role in the national security uh, science and technology ecosystem is to make what we think of are as pivotal investments, the things that will change the trajectory of technology and rapidly accelerate them on a much steeper curve. We're not always right in when we think those, where those pivotal investments will go, which means um, we fail, right? So our job is to take really big risks with the idea that the ones that succeed uh, tend to change everything. Um, and the ones that fail, what we have done is learn sufficiently that the rest of the ecosystem, which tends to be on a much more steady, sort of regularly making progress kind of a path, um, are able to continue um, healthily and learning both from the good and the bad of what we discovered. In order to take on that kind of a risk, you have to have an unusual business model. What we do is we hire program managers. We hire them from all across the country. They come from universities, they come from companies, they come from other government labs, nonprofits, you name it. What they all have is a passion to change the world. We bring them in, we give them access to almost $4 billion, tell them create the programs and execute on them that you think will change the world. And right around maybe the four-ish year mark, which is when they get comfortable and they finally understand how DARPA works, we kick them out and we, we keep that cycle going. Because the point is, you gotta be a little uncomfortable. You have to feel like you have a chance to change the world, and that's not something most people do um, without a little bit of a you know, weird, weird feeling in the gut that uh, you never quite know what's gonna happen in the next moment or in the next couple of days. So at any moment in time, it means we have about 100 DARPA program managers racing against the clock. Not all of them are focused on microelectronics or micro, microsystems, but uh, quite a number of them are, and one of the reasons has to do with a lot of emphasis that DARPA has put um, in the creation of and execution of the Electronics Resurgence, Re Electronics Resurgence Initiative, um, which we are continuing with ERI 2.0, and which what is what you're gonna be spending the next couple of days talking a whole lot about. So remember, within the ecosystem, our role is to take big risks and to push much further out into the future. So that is very, very much true within the microelectronics community as well. So how many were here for the last virtual summit? When I say here, I mean virtually, of course. All right, so quite a lot of you. All right, so that means you have been tracking that um, since that last summit, the conversation in the nation has obviously gotten um, ever more focused uh, on microelectronics. The need, as you just heard uh, from Senator Cantwell, for resilient domestic supply chains are a huge priority, and they have been driving a lot of focused U.S. investment uh, in R&D and manufacturing and in a variety of other sort of infrastructure-related um, support topics. You're going to be hearing a lot more uh, from key figures in the Chips and Science Act, including NIST, um, National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy. I think it's worth pointing out that while we collaborate constantly and very closely with all of those organizations and are making sure that we are synergistic in many ways with folks who are executing on chips and science, um, our funding is actually entirely independent. So in addition to what you heard the senator talking about, we are investing um, well over $3 billion over the next five years, focusing on what is after next. So we really are thinking long term and the question I have for all of you is, in keeping with DARPA's mission and those pivotal technology changes, um, what are the technologies that will cause 
technological surprise and enable those massive transformations um, in the coming years. We get a lot of our ideas from you, so my challenge to all of you is to think about that and talk to us um, so that we know what we should be investing um, our ERI 2.0 funds into. Okay, so having said that, those of you that are really familiar with DARPA, you can definitely watch, read your email or go check your coffee. Those of you that are, that are not quite sure yet, I, I tell you up front, I understand that we can be a challenge for first timers. Because we don't operate like traditional government organizations, we actually start about 50 new technology programs a year. They are not on a schedule. And if you ask me, I could not tell you what the next uh, five or six of them are actually gonna be because my program managers are the ones who are creating them and they are the ones who are telling us what needs to happen and what the next big breakthroughs can be. That means you have to be talking to us all the time. You have to be tracking. And you have to understand how to deal with the ARPA's process of calling for proposals and how we actually run the programs and how annoying we can be because we're asking you every week, it seems, what have you done for us lately? What kind of a breakthrough have you had? Um, and so you have to really think about whether or not this is a, a kind of a cycle um, and R&D sort of process that you're comfortable with. And hopefully you'll learn enough um, in the course of these next few days to get a feeling for whether or not DARPA is the leap that you want to make. But if it is, and I really hope it is, we want you to be making that leap with us and helping us to think the thoughts that we, um, dreaming up the ideas and thinking the thoughts that we didn't have yet. So one thing we did do recently, we have just launched something called DARPA Connect. So, all, so if you're interested at all, DARPA Connect is sort of your one-stop help desk for how to deal with DARPA. It's gonna include very soon actually online curricula um, to help you understand a lot of the, the terminology, how we do business, the questions our program managers have to answer when they start a new program, how to find and talk to a program manager, all of those things that have often been barriers to entry, particularly for new folks and especially a lot of the small companies um, and universities that don't historically already know how to navigate the system. So if you are remotely interested, just email DARPA Connect at DARPA.mil. You'll, um, you'll get on their mailing list and have access to the website, and uh, we will be uh, rolling out more and more activities, including you know, custom support workshops and, and tutoring and things like that, depending on what the needs of the community have. Um, and then, of course, I can't uh, be a DARPA director if I don't make my shameless recruiting plug. So if any of this has fascinated you in the sense that you think you might want to be a DARPA program manager, and you, wanna, you have that burning idea that you think could change the world, um, we have actually set up a recruitment reception from 5.30 to 6.30 tomorrow evening. Um, we welcome the opportunity to connect with you. So the bottom line is, talk to us. Bring us your ideas, ask questions, uh, learn about what we're thinking about, help us to create the next generation of programs, and be all of the people upon whom we will be placing many, many bets regarding the high risk but potentially enormous payoff in the future of microelectronics. Thanks a lot for your time, and have a wonderful conference. Uh.